chapter 6 of Revelation, we're getting into the middle part of Revelation, we're getting to the part where I would say if you haven't been around church much, if you haven't been around church much, you're not missing the arguments that this chapter brings. Chapter 6 for sure, chapter 7 for sure, you bring lots of arguments and lots of unnecessary divisions in the church. People have different opinions. People have different views. People have different takes on it. It is not my responsibility today to uh, convince you of any particular view or my view is the best view or this view is the best view. But just to show you the scriptures and let the Holy Spirit work on your hearts about what is the views that you've heard, things that you have encountered, see if those are right. I've always stick to the scriptures being right. Man can be, uh, can be, uh, man's not infallible. Man can be faulty. Man can have biases and all of us in some way capacity do that. It is best to trust the scriptures and let the scriptures speak for what it says and let us be conformed to the scriptures and not try to bring the scriptures in conformity to what we like for it to say or what's comfortable for us. Chapter six. It's not a puzzle. It's a revelation. It is not a puzzle that we need to figure out. It is a revelation that we need to accept and a revelation that we need to receive. That's how we need to approach it. First of all, it is a revelation, not a puzzle. A lot of people take, treat the book of Revelation as some, some incredible giant puzzle you have to put together and you get people get frustrated and they, they can't make heads or tails about it and and they go to church and, and the pastor or the teacher tells them something and they they, they, they have to take it in because they, they, they don't know how to figure out for themselves any other view. And they'll begin to accept things that sometimes don't match scripture. And because it's a puzzle, or at least people think it's a puzzle, then they, 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 um, they opt out. The default method is, well, if the pastor said it, then that must be true. I'm going to just take it at his word. Your job today is don't take anything on my word. Make sure it says it, says it in the word. Make sure it's in the word. If, it's not, if anything, anything I tell you is not in the word, don't believe me. That's your job. Don't believe anything I say tonight unless you can find it in the Bible. But if you do find it in the Bible and it is challenging, then you're going to have to wrestle with the scriptures. Not me. <laughs> you're going to have to wrestle with the scriptures. Um, as we were teachers and pastors, we're just messengers of what the Bible says. And if we're faithful to the word, then it will just have to let the word stand in the places where it's difficult. Let the Lord bring that further revelation into your heart. Uh, it's not our job to figure everything out like a puzzle, but it's our job to receive it, to accept it. And by God's grace and the spirit to understand it, maybe not tonight, but maybe next week or maybe a month from now or maybe a year from now. But if you're faithful, he who seeks finds, he who asks receives. He will not say will be open. So you be faithful to that. Uh, they're hard to interpret. The book of Revelation up to this point has been pretty straightforward. We've been in uh, the throne room of God, chapter four and chapter five, which is the this chapter. Uh, we've been in the seven churches. We've seen the revelation of the risen Christ to John, the revelator in an island called Patmos. Uh, let's turn to chapter one, just to set the tone. Some of you guys have been new to the study. Don't want to overwhelm you tonight, but hopefully you did bring your Bibles because we're going to have a lot of Bible today. Revelation chapter one, if you're there, uh, just to set the tone. Like I said, if you're here for the first time or um, but let me ask this question. Who has ever gone through a study of the book of Revelation fully, like from chapter one to the end, chapter 22? You gone through it? OK, uh, very good. OK, if you it's been a while, then good. Good refresher course. If you've never gone through one. Um, if you want to go back to the first five chapters, I encourage you to do that. Um, they're not very long in a sense of how much study time you need to put into, but it would be good to go through those five chapters. And if you want a little help, we have them recorded, chapter one through five on our, on our page, on our YouTube page, and you can avail yourself of those or any other favorite commentary you may have. Uh, but I do have to tell you that uh, the way we're teaching it the way I'm teaching it, uh, it may conflict with maybe some of your favorite teachers. I hope yes. you don't take that to heart. 
um, like it's an offense to you or something like that. It, it would differ from pop, uh, mainstream pop theology today. Uh, and, and you'll understand what, what that means later. It will be different. Not that it's, not that the Bible's different. And it's just, we're going to look at the Bible from a slight different perspective. The way the early church did it. The way the early church did it. Not the way 21st century America uh, will do it. Uh, but the way the early church would have understood it. Chapter 1, let's look at one verse real quick. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 9. If somebody want to read that for me, just let it rip from the top of your lungs so they can hear it and all of us can hear it. We've got a lot of people in our, in our room today. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the aisle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, there you have exactly what the writer wants to let you know, who he is, what's going on with him, where he's at, and why he's in that kind of trouble. He is in trouble because of the word of God. He is in tribulation because of the word of God. He is a fellow partaker because the early church was also suffering by this time. Under Domitian under Nero, under these Caesars that came uh, in the early church, there was tremendous suffering. And by this time, they had not only killed the apostles, 11 of them had been martyred. John was the last one, and he wasn't, he wasn't having a good time. He was not in, a, in Maui, hanging out, you know, just relaxing, having a good time, enjoying a, a 21st century life in a good life in this world, it tells you what he was doing. He was in trouble. He had tribulations. But not only him, other believers with him, fellow partakers. Mm -hmm. He's not outside of suffering. And he's an apostle. Just because you walk with Jesus doesn't mean you're immune to, you're immune to uh, adversity. We're going to have adversity. Here's John explaining what the adversities are, what he's in there for. So the letter, first of all, the letter... It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a letter, actually. It's a long letter. It's a, it's a visions, I guess you could say. It is given by God to Jesus, to an angel, to John. It is the most unusual of all the New Testament books. All the old, uh, New Testament books. It, it sounds like an Old Testament book, by the way. By the time you're done with Revelation, you realize Revelation is closer to an Old Testament book than it is a New Testament book, but it is in the New Testament. It is given by God. It is given to Jesus. Jesus gives it to an angel. An angel gives it to, well, let me backtrack a little bit. It is given by God. It is given to Jesus through the Holy Spirit to an angel given to John. So the Holy Spirit will take it to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear what the, seven, what the Holy Spirit says to the seven churches. No other book is like that. No other book in the New Testament has that kind of continuity. From God, the Father, to Jesus, the Messiah, to an angel, to John, and then he gives it to the other angels to take it to the churches so that the Holy Spirit can speak through this book. It's quite unusual, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so you're in for a, a good treat because the way the New Testament, the way the book of Revelation is laid out is for us to not only be amazed and intrigued by it, but is also to figure out how will the, new, how will the early church understood it. That's our first job tonight, is how did the early church understood it? It's hard to understand a book unless you go back to how the, how the recipients of that letter or that book actually understood it. We might take, this is probably the problem with uh, interpretation of the book of Revelation. We don't go back far enough to how it was meant to be read, how it was meant to be received. We're in the wealthiest and most affluent country in the world, yes. probably that has ever been in terms of uh, the amount of people that live in an affluent, life, affluent lifestyle. You take the book of Revelation and you read about sufferings and trials and tribulation and you just can't relate to it. You have a hard time relating to it. Why? You just, by experience, you've never had that as a Christian. Uh, you take this book to North Korea, you take this book to China and Muslim countries that Christians live in there, uh, they can relate to it very better than us. So we have a challenge. We have our lifestyle and... Uh, our comfort, and I don't want anybody to feel guilty about it. That's not, that's not the point. The point is we have to overcome that because it is written to Christians who are suffering. It was a means to comfort. It was a means to comfort them. 
And so if you don't get comfort out of the book of Revelation, it probably means you're not suffering because the book of Revelation is a book that was meant to comfort people. It was meant to comfort their problems and trials were going to be solved through Jesus. He was the conquering king and he's going to come and destroy Rome. He was going to come and destroy the oppressing government and the kingdom that was over them at that point, which was Rome. And you can just read verse 9. Who put him in there? It was Domitian. It was the Roman Empire who put John in prison because of the word of God. So you have to take that first in consideration. Most people jump right into Revelation and say, I just want to know the future. Yeah. Am I right? I mean, yeah. Okay, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to mince, you know, mince words, but... People look at Revelation as a guide to future telling, almost like we're trying to be fortune tellers. That is not the primary purpose. It is about the future. Don't get me wrong. It is about the future. In chapter 6 and on, nothing's like this happened yet. We're, we're diving into some future things. And it's hard to know the future. And therefore, sometimes when we see visions of the future in the book of Revelation or in Zechariah or Daniel, we get confused because we, we haven't been there. We don't know what it's like. So we have to take that in consideration too. It is hard to interpret because we're not suffering. Secondly, we don't know the future. We can read about the future. And uh, the third thing we have to you know, consider is the fact that the book of Revelation with the symbolism and future things makes it hard to interpret fully because it is a book that's being revealed. It is still being revealed, meaning that the book itself... It's a revelation. The book itself is, the word revelation means unveiling. I don't have one here, but if you had something draped over, you know, this, this, this stand here, you have something draped over, and I lift it off the drape or the, the, the sheet, then you'll know what's behind the sheet, what's behind the curtain. That's what that word apocalypsis means, revelation. It means an unveiling. You know something's there. It's draped over. You can see there's a figure. There's something there but you can't really know it until it's lifted. Well, even though we have the book already, it is still revealed to us how things are going to play out. We can read it, but we don't know because it's still future for us how it's ultimately going to play out. We know the end. God knows the end from the beginning. He shows it to us. But by experience, we haven't really understood what Revelation is fully about because it's still future for us, right? So that, 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 you got to take that in consideration. This is where a lot of people get stuck because they try to understand things that are still about the future. And we don't know, really, the future. We can read about it, but the details and how it all plays out, we still are being taught by the Lord. This is why light needs to illuminate our hearts through the Holy Spirit. When we read the book of Revelation, blessed are those who read it, blessed are those who hear it, blessed are those who do it. Right? Because the book of Revelation is also a book about actions. What are you going to be like when these things begin to happen? Right? What are you going to be like when these things that Jesus says in the future will happen? What's your character going to be like? How are you going to handle adversity? How are you going to handle difficulties? How are you going to handle things that don't go so well for the believer? Right? Because we haven't been, we're not used to that. It'll challenge your faith. It'll challenge your faith. And so the book of Revelation is a book about doing as well. Not just hearing it. Not just reading it. Not fulfilling your curiosity. You know, because a lot of people do that. They go, well, tell me what's going to happen in the future. They go to the book of Revelation. Oh, this thing, this thing. And it's like, yes, curious minds want to know. I get it. But it's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose is to prepare us for what is going to happen so on the day of adversity, we would not fall, right? God's, the Lord said these things must take place. These things must take place. So when you read the book of Revelation, it is God unveiling the future. But the future has a glorious end. The glorious end is Jesus is going to come and rule and reign and the governments will be upon his shoulder. No problem there. I like that. I just don't like the details that led us to that point. And the Bible uses a, the metaphor of a woman in labor. Right, having a child, it's no easy thing. Ladies, right? You're pregnant, you have a baby, trials, tribulations. You feel like the great tribulation is upon you, right? Well, that's what the Bible explains it, tribulation. It's like a woman in child labor. Sorry, Amanda. Uh, it's going to, for a momentary, for a momentary section of their lives, uh, ladies are going to deal with tribulation. Right? But then the baby comes and they want to have another one. 
So you, you see that it's not, it's not so bad. It's not so bad, right? right? You ever heard of the term Irish twins? <laughs> or Mexican twins, right? Um, right? They have the baby, they have another one. A great tribulation? Well, that wasn't so bad. The baby makes it all worth it. And that is true. Being with Jesus will be absolutely worth it. Every second of it will be worth it. And uh, so let's, let's get into chapter 6. I talked enough about it. Verse 1. I saw, John says, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with the voice of thunder, Come. Let's stop there for a moment. John is seeing the same vision of chapter 4 and chapter 5. He hasn't left. He hasn't left the throne room of God, right? Um, by the way, when we, when we talked about today about maybe looking at it a little bit different, we're going to be looking at some Old Testament passages too to tie it all together. The book of Revelation has over, I forget how many, over 800 direct quotations and allusions, more than that, Illusions and, and that, that correlate to the Old Testament. Not only straightforward text, but illusions. And the symbols that are in the Old Testament are found in the New Testament in, in the book of Revelation as well. So we're going to tie in a lot of the Old Testament to this because we need to. We need to explain the Bible explains itself. So we're not going to rely on a commentary tonight. It'll be your favorite pastor or teacher, right? Sorry to, sorry to disappoint you. We're gonna re- not going to rely on a commentary. We're going to rely on the Bible. Now, that's a refreshing thought, isn't it? We're going to rely on the Bible to tell you what it says and, um, and for us to accept it. So we're going we're gonna to tie it in, and we're going to tie it in with connections to other passages and patterns and the way people behave in different situations. We're going to look at Joseph tonight, too, more closely, the story of Joseph. So hopefully you brushed up on your Genesis reading, all right? brushed up on your Genesis reading on Joseph. Uh, But we're dealing with not just linear history, but patterns and cycles in the book of Revelation. When you get to the end of chapter 6 tonight, you're going to find out that Jesus is is about to come. Right? And that's it. Jesus comes in chapter 6. Well, what do you do with the rest of the 16 chapters? You still have 16 more to go. Right? The reason why... People get confused as they take Revelation in a linear way, and then you find out that there's some problems just linear, because Jesus seems to come different times. He comes in chapter 11, comes back again in chapter uh, chapter 15, uh, sorry, chapter 14, then he comes back again in chapter 19. Well, how many times does Jesus come? He comes twice, right? First coming, second coming. Why, Why does the book of Revelation put Jesus as about to come? at four different spots in the book of Revelation is because it's giving you different angles, different views from heaven on earth, right? From the perspective of the beast and people from the earth. It's a frightful thing when Jesus comes. But from heaven, it's glorious. From God's perspective is the lamb and the lion who is about to reign and step into this world to rule and reign. But it happens at different times. Book of Revelation is not trying to fool you or trick you. It's just giving you, like a movie, different angles, different camera angles of the same event. More information will be given to you. Every time you read about Jesus coming, there'll be more information, more intensity, more details about his return. And so that's what we have to look at uh, in a very clear way. Jesus spoke about this event, his coming, at different times. And here John is giving a vision, same vision as chapter 4 and chapter 5, and the heavenly court has been praising the Lord, chapter 4 and chapter 5. This is just review from last, last week, or last month, sorry, or the month before. We didn't do one last month, so, sorry, from uh, March. Uh, the heavenly court is praising God, chapter 4 and chapter 5. I'll get you cut up. The heavenly court is praising the lion and the lamb, right? The one who sits on the throne and to the lamb because Jesus is presented in chapter 4 and chapter 5 as two different views of Jesus. He says, John says, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 1, he's the risen Lord. And then in chapter 5, in chapter 4 and 5, he is one who is standing in the midst of the throne as a lamb that was slain. Well, what happened to the risen Savior? Well, different pictures of Jesus, right? Different 
camera angles of Jesus. He is the risen Savior, the glorified Lord, but he's also, he'll never stop being our lamb that was slain. In the midst of the throne, in the most important place in the universe, there stood a lamb as it was slain. Isn't that wonderful? They didn't stand a warrior, you know, with his enemies under his feet. It stood a lamb as if he was slain. But then it switches real quick, and then he sees a lion, a lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, what is it? Is he a lamb as if it was a slain, or is he a conquering king, a lion? Both, yes. Different angles of Jesus, right? He's not just a suffering servant. He is a conquering hero. He is the conquering king who's going to establish the kingdom, right? And then all of heaven rises up in worship. It breaks up in this amazing worship, chapter 4 and chapter 5, a few times, actually. The elders, the four living creatures, myriads of angels, thousands upon thousands of angels are all praising the Father, the one who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And they say of the Lamb, for you are worthy. You are worthy. And the worthiness of Jesus is not because he is strong and powerful and subdued his enemies. It is very clear from the revelation that the worthiness comes from his suffering. The willingness to obey the Father and lay down his life. And he is worthy because he was obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Now that sets up an interesting theme here in Revelation because how are believers going to overcome? How are they going to be worthy, in a sense, to escape the things that are coming upon the earth? What's the overcoming? How are we going to overcome? It's by loving God more than our own lives. Loving and obedience to God even more than our own lives. That's when Revelation 12, it says, Those who overcome the beast, those who overcome Satan, will overcome them by the blood of the Lamb and the testimony, right? And the power of their testimony. And they did not love their lives until the end. They were willing to let it go. Why? Because our conquering hero has done that already. He has gone before us, and he showed us the way to overcome. Is by loving God even more than our own lives. And it came down to that to Jesus, and it was happening to the early church, too. They had to love God and lay down their lives even beyond what they ever thought possible. They never thought it would come like this. Jesus explained it. You'll have tribulation in these days. He said it several times. And there's a scroll. And this is the key part. There's a scroll in heaven. And no one is open. Nobody's worthy to open it except Jesus, except the Lamb. Right? John is inconsolable. He's crying. He's weeping. No one is worthy except the line of the tribe of Judah. He has conquered. He is worthy because he obeyed God and he laid down his life, right? And all that overwhelming emotion turns into praise and worship of God. And it ends in this worship of praise of God, of Jesus, because his obedience has led him to be worthy. And he's qualified. He is qualified and God the Father is going to entrust the rest of his creation, the rest of human creation, the future of his creation into the hand of Jesus. This is what's happening where the, where the scroll that is sitting on the throne, the one who sits on the throne has it, and Jesus is worthy to take it from the Father. And now this scroll is locked, it's sealed, it's got seven seals, and <coughs> Jesus is the only one who can unlock it. Now what's in those seals? What's in that uh, 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 scroll, I should say? What's in that scroll It's the future of humanity. What does God have for us until the end of the age? What is going to be, uh, what's the plan of God? What is God prepared for those who uh, are his children? Well, we don't know until the seal is open. We don't know. We don't know until the scroll is open. That's why John is weeping. He goes, no, we will never know. We will never know what is going to be God's plan for the future of the world. Uh, we're going to live in this sinful world forever and ever, right? Rome is going to be in power, and then another kingdom is going to be in power, and this thing is never going to end. And that's why John weeps, because no one's ever going to know. But he, who is of the Father, he is from the Father, who came to this world to save us and to establish the kingdom, he is worthy because he laid down his life. He's redeemed us. Right? And that's the whole praise of heaven, is that he has redeemed mankind through his blood. 
And God is now entrusting Jesus with the rest of the book of Revelation, with the rest of humanity and his creation and what is going to happen in the future. It's in the hands of Jesus. I hope that makes you a little more comfortable today. <laughs> a little more comfort, I should say, not comfortable, comfort. A more comfort into your soul that the, the rest of your life, the rest of human history is in the hands of Jesus. Amen. He opens and no one shuts. He shuts and no one opens. And he is going to open the seals. And once he opens them, ain't nobody going to put it back. Amen. Mankind is going to try to bring it back. Oh, they're going to try. Revelation 17, they even, they even want to make war with the Lamb. The kings of the earth want to make war against Jesus. Try to prevent him from coming and establishing the kingdom. But once he opens it, there's no turning back. Once the baby, once the water breaks, the baby's coming. It's just, it's just a matter of time. Not if, but when. Sorry, but it's a good example, right? <laughs> It's a good example here. Oh, uh, Amanda's, uh, uh, you know, exhibit A. <laughs> yes, yes. Once the water breaks, baby's coming, right? And once Jesus breaks the seal, it's only a matter of time before he comes, right? So let's get into chapter six. Again, the four living creatures saying with a, vo a voice of thunder, they say to John, come. He's in the courtroom of God. He hasn't left yet. And he sees something that might have been quite dramatic for him. I looked and behold. The word behold there is he is perplexed. It's not just like, oh, there's something coming. It's more, what is this coming? There's a perplexity about his beholding. A white horse. And he was sat on it. At a bow. And a crown was given to him. And he went out to conquer and to conquer. And he broke the second seal. Now notice... Uh, verse 3, he broke the second seal. There's always Jesus who is bringing this about, right? He's bringing this about, and we'll explain more about the seals, because it, the seals do cause some controversy. Why is Jesus breaking the seals? Can he just not do it? Well, remember, the scroll is the future of the earth. The future plan of God is in the scroll, and only Jesus can open it. Only Jesus can let us know what it is, but he is in charge. He is the one in charge. He's the one that he's not, God is not a, a expectator. He's not an expectator to, to these events. He's not going, ooh, that's bad. Oh, boy. Sorry about that. He is the first cause. Notice this. He is the first cause. When we talk about first causes, who is behind it all, it is Jesus. He is bringing this about, and you'll notice, and you'll, we'll find out in a moment what these things are about. Why is he letting it happen, right? That's another question people have is, if it's bad, why is Jesus involved in this, right? Because that's, that's, a, that's a fair question, right? If these things are not so good, these seals are not so good, but we see Jesus behind the seals, he's the cause of the breaking of the seals, then there has to be an explanation, right? Because we don't correlate things bad with Jesus. It just depends on the definition of bad, and the definition of why this is, this is happening. Right? But, uh, second seal. I heard a second living creature say, Come, and another red horse, and another, a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that man will uh, slay each other, and a great sore was given to him. And he broke the third seal. And I heard the third living creature say, Come, and looked, and behold, a black horse, and see who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard something like a voice of the center, uh, uh, in the center of the four living creatures, a quart of wheat for a denarius and a three quarts for barley for a denarius and do, do not damage the oil and the wine. And when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the four living creatures say, come. And I looked and behold an ashen horse and he who sat in it had the name, had the name death and Hades was following him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beast of the <coughs> earth. Now, these are the first four seals. And these are the famous four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? The four horsemen of the apocalypse have been very well known, especially in Western culture. Many paintings, many artists, many poems, many things that we know, even non-believers know about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. A very well-known imagery in the Bible. And the first seals have to do with four different horses, 
a white one, a, black, a red one, a black one, and a ashen horse, like a pale green. That's the word for, if somebody has a different translation. Uh, does anybody have a different translation for an ashen horse? Is the fourth seal? Pale. Pale? Okay, pale. It's like a greenish, pale, ashen, kind of sickly color. That's the best way to describe it. Uh, and from the Greek, it's, uh, it's a sickly green. Think of just somebody, you know, not like vomit or anything like that, but think of something sickly, greenish, doesn't quite look healthy, right? Um, so what are we to make of this? What are we to make of this? There is no wonder that John looks at this and he wonders, what in the world are these things coming? Why does it all mean? Well, instead of pulling out our favorite commentary, Let's see what the Bible has to say about this, right? Let's turn to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah explains it a little bit more. I'm sorry if you haven't been to a Bible study in a long time. Uh, we're going to be looking at some Old Testament scriptures and really digging deep in some of these scriptures. So hopefully it doesn't bother you or bore you. Um, if, um, if you need it more of a, uh, I, I guess, a lesser, deeper study, then we can talk about it afterwards. But um, we like to dig in deep. It doesn't make us more spiritual. It's just we're just trying to find the truth. Zechariah chapter 1. Zechariah chapter 1. Now, Zechariah is a very interesting prophet. He is a post-exilic prophet. Fancy word for after the exile. What happened after the exile? The Jews came back. They came back from Babylon. After 70 years, they came back. And they had different prophets. Haggai being one of them. Zechariah being another. And the people of God needed to go to work. They needed to get back to work. The first thing they had to build was the temple. And they were not very good at building the temple. In fact, they started the construction and the foundation laid there for 20 years without anybody doing anything about it. And God had encouraged Zechariah, as well as Haggai, as well as Zerubbabel, to get the people back to work. They needed to build the, the, the house of God. They needed to get back to building the house of God. It has, it, it has a deep meaning in a, in a different study we can talk about building the house of God and expanding the house of the Lord and what that means for us in the New Testament. And so we are the house of God. We are the temple of God now in the New Testament. So it has a meaning for the church, but that's not our subject today. It is to say the people went back to work by the Spirit of God empowering them and Zechariah encouraging them. But one of the things Zechariah sees, he sees a vision. Chapter 1, look at verse... Eight, I saw at night, Zechariah chapter 1, behold, a man was riding on a red horse, and he was standing among the myrtle trees, and, which were in the ravine, with a red horse, a sorrel horse, a white horse behind him. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? And the angel who was speaking to me said to me, I will show you what these are. And the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are, whom, uh, these are those whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth, to patrol the earth, another way of saying to go through the earth, basically like a, a unit patrolling just through the earth. Yeah. And they answered, to, and they ans uh, so they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth is, at, is peaceful and it is quiet. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long would you have no, uh, no compassion for Jerusalem and the cities of Judah in which we have been indignant these 70 years? The Lord answered and said, and the Lord, uh, the Lord answered the angel who was speaking with me with gracious words and comforting words. So the angel who was speaking with me said to me, proclaim, proclaim saying, thus said the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion, for I am very angry with the nations who are at ease. For a while I was, I was only a little angry, and then they further their disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return to Jerusalem with compassion. My house will be built up, declares the Lord of hosts. A measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem. Now, what does it all mean? Zechariah sees a vision, a man standing on, near the myrtle trees. He's riding a red horse. And there are three other horses along, three other horsemen that are coming along with the man with the myrtle trees, standing by the myrtle trees. Now, the man that is in the myrtle trees riding a red horse is called the angel of the Lord. He is called the angel of Yahweh. He is not a, when he appears, when the angel of the Lord appears, he is not a regular angel. He is not a regular angel. This goes back to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis. He is not just an angel. He is the angel of the Lord. He is the one who is the messenger of God. 
And the word angel, that's what it means. The word angel means messenger. He's a special messenger. He relates to God. He talks to God. He says in, in Genesis that he is God. In fact, he speaks as if he's God. Uh, the angel of the Lord is a very curious figure in the Old Testament. And uh, uh, I will tell you who he is. He is a pre-incarnate figure of Jesus. He is the messenger of Yahweh, not a created being. People get confused with the angel part. And they say, you're saying Jesus is an angel, like Jehovah's Witnesses would say. And they say, no, 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 no. Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they say Jesus was created. The Bible never says Jesus was created. But he is the messenger of God. He is the one that God sends forth to lead Israel in the wilderness. Who, who fought the battle of Jericho? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we sing the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Remember that song? Yeah. yeah. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, 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 right? Well, that song is a great song, but it's slightly a little less biblical than you think. It was the angel of the Lord who fought the battle of Jericho, right? Because he was the commander who Joshua bowed before. And he says, who are you? Are you for us or for our enemies? And he says, he is the Lord of hosts. He is the host. He is the army. He's the, 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 the Lord, the general of God's armies. And he's the angel of the Lord. He is the angel that, or the messenger that Jacob wrestled with at the, at the brook of Penuel. He is the one that showed up to Samson's parents to declare the birth of Samson. All through the Old Testament, you find this figure, the angel of the Lord. Not to take any more time, but you could, you could read more about it as you read it. The angel of the Lord standing there, and he's near the, 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 the myrtle trees. And what's interesting about this is he, he talks to these other angels, right? These other angels that are there. Now, these are regular angels. He's, they're not called the angel of the Lord. These are regular angels. And he says, you know, how's it going? How's everything going? And they report back to the angel of the Lord. It says, we're patrolling the earth. And everything's at peace and everything is quiet. That means that at this time, the Jews uh, in Jerusalem, the nations around them were not troubling them. The nations around them were not troubling them. There were trouble within. There were some problems within Israel or within Jerusalem at that time. But the first horseman is the angel of the Lord. The other horsemen are just simply angels. And the angel prays to the Lord. Look at verse 12. He prays to the Lord. The Lord, the angel of the Lord, prays to the Lord. O Lord of hosts, how long would you have no compassion for Jerusalem? So Jerusalem was being attacked, just like it is now, by enemies of Israel that were near Jerusalem. They were being attacked. They were not, allowed, they were not being allowed to construct the temple. Uh, they were the Sumerians. They were... I uh, uh, forgot the other guy's names, but the, I uh, uh, oh, forget the guy's name. There were three men that are mentioned in the book of Ezra that troubled, and Nehemiah, that troubled Israel, and that they were not allowing the people of God to build a temple. And so the Lord, the angel of the Lord says, Lord, how long are you going to forget Jerusalem? And he says, I didn't forget Jerusalem. I am zealous. I am jealous for Jerusalem. Uh, by the way, this is another interesting picture of the angel of the Lord talking to the Lord. You know, is Jesus talking to the Father. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. There are pictures throughout the Old Testament when God is speaking to, to Jesus, the Lord speaking to the Lord. Here's one example of them. Uh, the angel of the Lord speaks to the Lord, and then the Lord answers. And the Lord lets the angel, or the messenger, know what he's saying, and then he tells uh, Zechariah. Uh, there were words of comfort, and there were gracious words, for verse 14. Proclaim this, thus says the Lord, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. I am very angry with the nations. Why is God angry with the nations? Because the nations did something that God did not intend for them to do. Uh, the Bible says that God judged his people. There's no doubt about it. God judged his people. And he judged them in a very uh, severe way. He kicked them out of the land. He kicked them out of the land. And... God was going to use nations to deal with his people because of their rebellion, their immorality, their idolatry. But then the nations took it upon themselves to inflict more on the Jewish people. They took it further. God had never intended them for them to be cruel to his Jewish people, to his people. And that's what it says in, uh, in verse, 14, uh, verse 15. I was a little angry. Yes, he was angry with the, the, the Jews and what they did. And they got him kicked out of the land. But then it says, but they furthered their disaster. They went further than what God intended. 
This is what got the nations in trouble. Babylon, Edom, uh, in the book of Obadiah, one chapter, easy read, right? The book of Obadiah, God uh, is angry at Edom. Edom is still a country in Jordan. Still to this day, a country in Jordan. And God was angry at Edom because they lived comfortably. They lived securely in these big mountains, the mountains of Petra. You can still see them today. These great red mountains. And the city was up in those mountains. It was impenetrable. And God said, you dwell in a very much a fortress, but I'm going to bring you down. And why was the judgment to Edom? Because when Babylon came to judge Israel, the Edomites jumped on the side of Babylonians and kicked the Jews when they were down. They jumped on them and they made their suffering worst. And that's what God said to Edom. What you have done to Israel, it will be done to you. That's the, it's the judgment, we call it the judgment of Obadiah. Countries that come against the Jewish people, countries that come against Israel, will suffer the consequences. What they did to them will come back to them. Retribution upon their own head, the Bible says. Look how much Germany suffered after the Holocaust. Oh, yeah. Remember how they, they, took, they took the Jews into the concentration camp? They boarded up everything up. They put them in concentration camps, barbed wires and everything. Well, not too long after World War II ended, what happened to Germany? Remember what happened to Germany? They had East and West Germany. Barbed wire. Anybody that was jumped, jumped over the barbed wire from East Germany to West Germany was gone down. Well, why that happen? Because when the Jews were in concentration camp, if any Jew went over the barbed wire, they were shut down. They were gone down. So whatever happened to, whatever Germany did, it came back upon them. Look what happened to the Spanish, the great Spanish kingdom, right? The great Spanish armada, right? In 15, I'm sorry, in 1200, they had the great inquisition. Any Jew, probably any Christian too, uh, they persecuted them. Well, not too long after that, Francis Drake was sinking the Spanish armada. Whatever happens to them, whatever they did to the Jews, they come back on their own head. Look what happened to the UK. God, it says of the UK, the sun never set on the British Empire. Everywhere you went around the world, India, uh, United States, as far as uh, the, the Caribbean, on the other side, in, 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 even in Africa, in Asia, Hong Kong, everywhere was the British Empire. Well, they did something. They turned their back on the Jewish people. Around the 1800s, they turned their back. And soon after that, within, within 50 years, um, India got its independence, Hong Kong, all these places, they were no longer under British control. And uh, now the sun sets on the British Empire every 24 hours. Whatever you did, it'll come upon your own head. Yes. That's not just coincidence. <laughs> It is historical fact, absolutely. It's biblical fact. Obadiah said it. Well, Edom, the Edomites were going to suffer that consequence. God is going to be angry with his people. Now, just for the sake of time, verses 17 through uh, 21, God was angry with his people, but now he's going to be angry with the nations. And it says, The angel of the Lord proclaimed, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities will again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again come for Zion and again choose Jerusalem. God has a plan for Jerusalem. God has a plan for his people. The plan for Jerusalem includes the return of the Lord. Jesus is going to come back to Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem is very important to God. It's his, it's his land. It's his city. He calls it his city. It's my land. Why is it so important for God, this, this little city called Jerusalem? Right? No precious metals. No oil. No seaport. It really almost an insignificant city. But what has happened there? Nobody know what has happened in Jerusalem? In history. In history. Just name one thing that's happened in Jerusalem that's very important. Jesus, Jesus, died. Jesus was there. Jesus died. Jesus was teaching. The temple of God was there. The glory of God was in the midst of the people, right? The cross, the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jerusalem. On and on. You just go back to the city of David, right? All, this, all these Old Testament, rich New Testament 
events that have happened in Jerusalem, it is very important to God. And for us spiritually, it is the place where Satan got his defeat. The cross. The cross took away the power of Satan. It was in Jerusalem. But what do you think Satan's going to do now? Trying to destroy it. What do you think he's doing now through whether it's the EU, the UN, Muslim groups, terrorist groups, Hamas groups, Islamic Jihad, Iran, Russia, France, United States, no matter who it is, they're going to go after Jerusalem. Because Satan knows, because the story's not over yet. What's going to happen in Jerusalem? He's coming back to Jerusalem. He is going to reign in Jerusalem. It's where Satan will get his final defeat. Amen. He is trying to prevent that from happening. Make no mistake about it. All the problems you see in Jerusalem, you think it's just some Palestinian group against some Jewish groups, some right-wing group against some left-wing group, or you know the Pope's involved and he wants Pete. All of that is the smokescreen. What's behind the scene is Satan. Yeah. Satan is trying to prevent the return of Christ. Satan is trying to keep people from knowing Jesus. There's many Jews in Jerusalem. And he doesn't want them to know. He wants them to be deceived. And he wants us to be deceived too. But God doesn't want us to be deceived. God wants us to know the truth. So that's what it says. Jerusalem, I'm going to choose back Jerusalem. It's going to be a great city again. Now, it was never a great city uh, during the time of the New Testament. Because it was under Roman Empire. It was under the Romans. It hasn't been really a great city since the time of David. But this is prophetic. This is a future thing. It will become the most important city in the world. Amen. In the New Testament, oh, sorry, the Old Testament and the New Testament, it tells us that Jerusalem will be the place where Christ will rule and he will reign. And it'll be the top of the mountain. It'll be the biggest mountain on the earth. It'll be the place where everybody goes to know the Lord. Right? The Bible says in Isaiah 2, Come, let us go to Zion. Let us go up to Jerusalem. And there we will know the Lord. We will hear from God. And He will teach us. He will guide us. Light will come out of Zion. Salvation will come from Zion. Jesus is about to come to Jerusalem. He's coming back very soon. So Jerusalem. And then He says, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there were four horns. Now, for the sake of brevity, we'll just kind of summarize the rest of Zechariah 1. The four horns, horns in the Bible are a type of power, authority, horns. These four horns are nations that have come against Jerusalem, against the Jewish people. And Zechariah sees that there were four horns, and he sees four craftsmen, four builders. And those craftsmen or carpenters or builders are going to uproot these horns. These nations that have inflicted wounds and, and, and great pain upon God's people will be uprooted, will be uprooted. Read the final part of the book of Revelations. The nations gather together. The nations come and want to destroy Jerusalem, want to destroy. It's a siege against Judea and Jerusalem. But God does not let that happen. Amen. He will uproot the nations. Even though all the nations round about come against Jerusalem, God will be like a wall of fire, it says. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Amen. We're about to see some major things happen in the Middle East. Yeah. This stuff is just beginning, folks. Yeah. This stuff is just beginning. We've crossed a major threshold, I believe, this past month. Because it's not, they're not just attacking certain cities. They're really attacking Jerusalem. That's where the, the, it's spreading from Jerusalem, but that's where the epicenter was. And more importantly, it was the Temple Mount. Yeah. It was the Temple Mount that began all this. Mm -hmm. So see it as a prophetic significant that not just Golan Heights, not just Gaza, not just Haifa or Tel Aviv. It is Jerusalem, and it, from there it went everywhere in Israel. And so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for sure. Now, let's go back to Revelation, because these horses appear again. Now, you automatically would say, well, Pastor, there's some, some discrepancies here. They're not the same color horses. You're right. The major theme from Zechariah is two red horses, judgment, war. How is God going to deal with the nations? God is going to inflict them with war. Among themselves, they will fight and they will war within the nations and they will fight so heavily that will, they will even destroy themselves. Mm -hmm. I guess you can say in a, in, a, in a real way, Jesus, by opening the seals, is going to give them what they want. They want to destroy themselves. They want, 
evil wants to destroy. And given enough time, evil will come against evil. It will destroy other evil things, right? Evil is a self-consuming thing. It'll try to destroy good. But once it thinks it has destroyed good, it'll also try to destroy other evil. That's how, that's the, uh, uh, the amazing thing about evil. It's just self-consuming. It will consume itself. And so uh, let's go back to Revelation 6. Uh, let's look at the first horse. It is white. Verse 2, it is a white horse. It's not a red horse. It is a white horse. It's a little bit different than Zechariah. We'll go back to Zechariah in a moment. Because in Zechariah, we have four horses. Two of them are red. In Revelation, we have four horses. Only one of them is red. But the first one is white. The first one is white. So red horse has to do with war and judgment. War and judgment. Uh, that's the judgment upon the nations. So the principal message in Zechariah is God is angry with the nations and he's going to war against them. And he's going to let them have war. Two red horses. And Revelation is a little bit different. It begins, it has a red horse, but it begins with a white one. It begins with the white one. And so what is the white one? Well, the white is always a picture of victory, purity, and conquer. And it says of this rider, of this rider on the horse, not only are there four horsemen, but there are four riders. The rye horse, he who sat on it had a bow, and it was given to him a crown. It was given to him a crown. Notice that it wasn't something he took. It was something given to him. Right? Everything in this world, power, authority, everything in this world, it is given. Right? It is given. God is the one who gives the authority and power. Amen. Now, the question you and I will have is why does God grant power to very wicked people, very evil people? Is that the story of Job and the story of the psalmist? They couldn't figure it out. But God in his plan, he has a plan. And the plan is to give authority, even to evil people, because we know their end. The end is not with the Lord. The end is self-destruction. God will allow even evil to exist and give it some leeway, I guess you could say. Give it a leash. It'll give it a leash. It won't go any further than what God has allowed it to go. But people have free will. And God allows human governments to exercise that will, whether for good or whether for evil. Now, God knows what they're going to do. God ultimately knows everything, right, from the end, from the beginning. But he also will give evil authority on the earth. That's going to be a major challenge for us when we get to chapter 13 about the Antichrist. Because it is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience and perseverance of the saints. Twice in the book of Revelation, it mentions it. And twice is related to the Antichrist. Now, why will we need patience and perseverance when dealing with the Antichrist? That's the question I would have about Revelation. Why Revelation twice? He is the patience and perseverance of the saints. And they both have to do with the coming of the Antichrist. Why do we need patience and perseverance? To deal with the events. To deal with the fact that God is the one who allows them to come into power. It says the Holy Spirit will be moved out of the way. He will step aside and allow the evil one to be revealed. We're going to have to deal with the fact that there's evil in the world and more evil is about to come. And we're going to have to say, Lord, you're in control. You're in charge. I see evil all around me and it's going to get, it's going to get more evil. How can, I, how can I balance my Christian faith with the world around me? We're going to need to be saturated in the Word of God. We're going to need to stay close to Jesus to really come to grips with all this, that no matter what, it is Jesus who's opening the seals, not man. It's not King Jong Il. It's not King Jong Young. It's not uh, Putin. It's not Biden. It's not Macron. It's not the EU. It's not Klaus Schwab. None of these guys are opening. They're just there for the ride. It is Jesus who's knowing the end from the beginning. He will open the seals. And allow these evil men, allow these evil governments to take place for their own destruction, for their own judgment. Remember, God is angry at the nations for what they've done to his people. And when we get to the fifth seal, you're going to see why God is so angry, because it's not just the Jews. They've also done things to his church, to his, to his, to his living body, to, his, to, the, to the, the body of his son. They've done things to, the, to Christians, and God will vindicate them. Amen. And he would have enough. This, remember, a comfort to the early church. Rome was in power. 
John is in prison. How are we ever going to, Lord, are you in charge? Are you still in control? The book of Revelation comes to your rescue. Yes, I am. And I'm angry at the nations. And I'm going to give them four consecutive seals, four consecutive things are going to happen on the earth. And the first one seems to be rather, rather benign. Oh, it's a white horse. Well, that's nice. He has a crown. It was given to him. Well, that's nice too. And he goes and he conquers him to conquer. Well, well what's this about? <laughs> Turn to Matthew chapter 24 and let's see what Jesus said about this. Remember, we're comparing Scripture with Scripture. We're trying to figure out what did the Bible mean by all this. And the first place we've got to go to is what Jesus said. Okay? Now, this is, an, this is an important axiom, an important fact that we need to get really down whenever we're interpreting prophecy. This is a very, very important one. So I'll let you get to Matthew 24. And then um, I'll need your attention very quick because this is probably a very important rule to remember when interpreting prophecy. Matthew 24. The, the important thing is here. When we interpret the letters of Paul, the letters of John, the letters of James, Jude, Revelation specifically, or the Old Testament prophets, we need to overlay them over a foundation. What is our foundation? What Jesus said about his coming. We first start with Jesus. He knows quite well about his coming. They asked him. He said it. Matthew 24, 25, Luke chapter 21, Mark chapter 13, the whole book of John. He knows when he's coming. We first have to start with Jesus. Once we know what Jesus said about his coming, then we can overlay the epistles and the book of Revelation on top of what he said so we can get a clear picture. The problem and the confusion, I believe, comes is we're trying to read the book of Revelation without knowing what Jesus said about his coming. And then we read Jesus later and say, huh, that kind of doesn't go well with Revelation. It's kind of off. Well, okay, I'm just going to stick with Revelation and I'm just going to ignore what Jesus said. No, 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 no. Big, big, big problem there. We first have to know what Jesus said about his coming. Then we can understand what John said because John is not going to contradict Jesus. Is that, is that, is that, is that, right? is that a, an important axiom, an important yeah. rule to remember? Yeah. It's not going to contradict it. It's going to complement it. It's going to build upon what Jesus said. So what did Jesus say? The first thing he said, Jesus said about his coming. Matthew 24, verse 3. They asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Verse 4. See to it that nobody deceives you. First thing that Jesus said, don't let anybody deceive you. For there will be many false Christs, and they will say to you, I am the Christ, and will mislead just a few people. No, it says many. Will mislead many. And then you will hear of wars. So the first sign, deception. Second sign, wars and rumors of wars. Don't be frightened by these things. These things must take place, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation. Hey, that's what Zechariah said. God is angry with the nations, and the nations are going to bear the burden, are going to bear the brunt of the judgment of God. God is angry at the nations for the treatment of his people, and he's going to give them judgment, war. War will unleash on the world. Now, notice this. It's the government who will do the war. It is the judgment that they will go to war, but it's the people, the actual governments and other nations who will fight against each other um, in which God says, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. You want evil? You want war? God will take peace from the earth. Now think about this. God is the only one who can bring peace. Amen. Now when we pray, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now this is challenging. As I've heard this before, this is not a, a knock on anybody here. Or anybody online. People pray, and I've heard it in religious circles. Oh, we just need to pray for peace. We just need to pray. For, as if you're praying for some ethereal substance that's going to come down from heaven and land on tanks and land on you know, people. And everybody's going to be at peace. There's only one way to have peace. It's Jesus. Amen. He is the Prince of Peace. right? He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Shalom. He is the Shalom of God. The only way to have peace is Jesus. 
You have peace today because Jesus, Amen. he made peace Amen. with us through the blood of his cross, Amen. says Paul. The blood of his cross brought you peace. Peace with God and inevitably the peace of God in your hearts through the cross. You made reconciliation with God through the blood of his cross. That's the only way to have peace. Peace in your family, peace in your home, peace in your soul is to have peace with God, the peace of God that surpasses all knowledge. Right? Can't have peace without Jesus, without the Prince of Peace. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're really asking, Lord Jesus, come and bring peace. No matter what they do, what they you, I mean, they're going to try to bring peace. And as the prophetic words of Jeremiah and Paul says, they'll say, peace, peace, but there is no peace. And when they say peace and safety, we're all good. Everything back to normal. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as a woman, as a woman in labor. Contractions are going to hit. Boom. I thought it was over. I thought the first contraction was it. That's it. One contraction is you're good. Right, ladies? It's over? No. In fact, ladies here will tell you. Sorry, Amanda. It gets worse. And they're more frequent and more intense. I can prove it. We've had five kids and uh, my wife can tell you all about it. <laughs> can tell you all about the, the contractions and the lack of peace that comes under those times. Right? But you know that there's a future, a glorious ending to that. The baby's going to come. Peace and safety. God will take peace from the earth and war will unleash on the world. Second, second one. Then there'll be persecution. Verse 8. Uh, these things are just the beginnings of sorrow, the beginnings of birth pangs, and they'll deliver you to tribulation, and they will kill you, and they will be hated for my name's sake. In Luke chapter 21, it's not recorded in Matthew, but we have to take all of them together. Matthew 24, 10, 25, Luke 21, Mark 13. Mark and Luke add pestilence. They will be pestilence, and they will be famines. There will be pestilence, and there will be famines upon the earth. Wait a minute, that sounds like the, the seals. You're exactly 100% right. When John sees this vision, it is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 24. False messiahs, wars and rumors of wars, the red horse, famines, the black horse, pestilence, the pale horse, the, the, the ashen horse, right? They will come upon this world. It will be unleashed upon the world because... The first writer, many will come in my name and deceive many. He won, he comes on a white horse. Some people have said this is Jesus. Some people have said this is Jesus. Uh, he comes on a white horse and he's got a crown and all this stuff. I do not believe it's Jesus. Now Jesus does come on a white horse, Revelation 19. But I also know that Satan is a very, very good copycat. He is a very good imitator. He is a deceiver. He will try to falsify Jesus by bringing a man in his place. That's exactly what the word antichrist means. Mm -hmm. A man who <laughs> takes the place of Christ. Antichristos, literally in Greek, means not against, but instead. Anti, the, the, the prefix anti doesn't mean against. In English, it does. In Greek, it means instead of. Now, ultimately, of course, the Antichrist is against Christ. He will try to destroy the Lamb and his people. But the word anti means instead of. He is a false Christ. What does Jesus say? Many will come in my name and will deceive many. Think of false teachers today. Think of false prophets today. Think of people get on TV and prophesy false things in the name of the Lord that don't happen. Think of things that they will proclaim that they're from God, but they'll teach you something completely different. They'll knock on your door. Right? We're from the watchtower. We're from God. Witness to them. Tell them who Jesus, tell them who Jesus is. Don't turn the sprinklers on them, but just tell them who Jesus is. Uh, they'll knock on your door. They'll pedal up to your bike, uh, uh, pedal up on a bike to your door. They will tell you that they're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, just because they have the name Jesus doesn't mean it's Jesus. Right? I know a lot of Chris. They're not the same guy. <laughs> Chris, there's only one Chris Gill. That's it. But I know a lot of Chris. Just because they come in Chris's name doesn't mean they're the same Chris. Yeah. Hi, I'm Chris. Well, you're not Chris Gill. Get out of here, right? You're not the real Chris. 
He's the Antichrist. <laughs> That's right. The all That's right. <laughs> Many Antichrists had come to the world. Yeah. He's the real Chris. Just because they have the same name, just because the same Jesus doesn't mean it's the real Jesus. That's right. And people just say, oh, they say Jesus. They're kind of... Don't believe them. Don't believe them. Jesus told you that. In persecution. We'll get to the fifth seal. Let's go back to Revelation. Now, you see how they line up. By the way, you could do the same thing with Paul's letters. Paul says, there's deception that's going to come. Paul says... Sudden destruction will come upon them. They'll face say, peace and safety. Paul said they'll be persecuted. He suffered persecution himself and to persecute others. Uh, he says that there will be famines that will come. Paul endured a famine. We're going to get to the famine in a moment. Uh, the red horse, the second rider. Of course, the first rider is the Antichrist. That is my uh, understanding of this text. I don't believe it's Jesus. He keeps bad company. If this was Jesus, he keeps bad company. He's got war. He's got famine. He's got pestilence riding by next to him. And by the way, the, is the first horse is the initiation of this. The white horse initiates the next three. Right? So this is Jesus. We've got, we got some explaining to do, right? It is not an angel. Some people think it's an angel. It is not an angel. I believe this is what Jesus warned about. False Christ. A false Messiah will come. The Antichrist will come. And what do you think of white horse? Peace. And guess what happens after that? Look at verse 3. Then the second living creature said, Come, and a red horse, verse 4, went out. He who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth. God takes peace from the earth. When the Antichrist comes, it'll be nice and cushy for a little bit. Everybody, well, we're back to normal. Everything's good. We have peace, false peace. There'll be a false peace in the Middle East. There'll be a false peace all over the world. And then... He'll reveal his true colors. He's a man conquering to conquer, and there'll be a red horse. And of course, everybody knows this is, this is typology and this is imagery. It's not going to be a literal red horse running around, but it's this, the, the representation of it. There will be a tremendous war, bigger than World War I, bigger than World War II. There'll be bloodshed. It says here, there will slay, man will slay one another. All right? The judgment is upon the nations because of their godless life but also their rebellion against God. They wanted to have peace without God, and you can't have peace without Jesus. Right? Only the gospel can bring peace. But the world wants their own peace. Right? Uh, by the way, most of history, and this is done by secular historians, most of history has been war. There's only been a very short period of time when the man's been on the earth that they have peace on the earth. Did you know most of human history is filled with war? It's filled with war. I believe, I think it was a Roman historian who said most of history up to that point was basically war. How did Rome get into power? Wars. How did made, made military leaders get into power? War. How did Napoleon get into power? War. How did Hitler get into power? War. All these things will be wars and rumors of wars. And, um, and there hasn't been much peace on the, much peace on the earth uh, over the last 2,000 years. It's been mainly war. Let's say World War I, the war that ends all wars. We had World War II, <laughs> Korean War, Vietnam War. We had the Desert Storm I, Desert Storm II, Afghanistan. Those are the ones in America. What about the one in other countries? What about the ones in Africa? What about ones in Asia? What about the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution? All these wars, regional and global, have been absolutely destroying the world. First civil wars, yeah, there we go. First five, he broke the third seal. And the, four living, the third living creature said, come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse, he who had a pair of scales, and went out, and the, fourth, uh, and the voice of the four living creatures said, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Now, this is the basic things of life. Grain, food are going to be scarce, Right? How vulnerable is our world today? We live in a world where I'm not sure if you paid any attention to the last, I would say the last year, how much has changed, but how much inflation has ravaged our world. You're paying so much for gas. That's where people notice it the most, right? 
because companies try to do something with uh, food. They try to package it, smaller packages, so it looks the same. Oh, look, I'm getting all this. But if you look at it, wait, that's less ounces, right? Uh, Costco does this. I mean, it wasn't necessarily my choice, but we used to do it as a company. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, we had a, to keep the price the same, we had to you know, sell lower amounts, a smaller amount, so people didn't notice it. Because people would get upset. Hey, I'm paying the same thing for less. Well, if you make the packaging smaller, yes. it doesn't look so bad, does it? Oh, honey, look, I got three of them. <laughs> but they're tiny donuts, right? It's like, look, I got a steak. <laughs> mm -hmm. Big time. Absolutely. Famine, scarcity. All it needs is one bad drought, one bad crop. And the supply chains, by the way, supply chains is really broken in our nation, in our world. It's broken. Supply chains that supply. Um, Brother Savio, you work for a trucking company, supply chain, right? Um, we haven't noticed it too much here, but in the world, it's broken. There's 800 barges, 800 containers up by the south of the Mississippi that can't get through with grain, with soybean, and with oil, with all kinds of food. Why is it stuck there? Because the Interstate 40, the bridge that over the Interstate 40, it's broken, yeah. and they shut it down, and they're keeping all these boats from going south into the Gulf. That's a major vein, by the way. It's a major transportation, our Mississippi River. What's well, shut down now? What happened to the Suez Canal? What's going to happen if there's a, a bigger war with other nations getting involved in the Middle East? then the Suez Canal and the Strait of Hormuz are going to get shut down. And then they just shut down the pipeline of oil into the East Coast, colonial. So less oil, less transportation. People are not going to be traveling as much. Food is not going to be available as much. We're heading for some interesting, an interesting summer. Rolling blackouts and less oil. And if, there, if you find oil, very expensive, 6 to $8.00. A gallon on the cheap side, if you can find one, in the summer, because they're going to make it even less available. Because they're going to say, oh, you know, we need to conserve oil and all this stuff. Anyway, it's not a political thing. But they're just, this is going to be the case. Less food around, right? More shutdowns. It doesn't look, doesn't going to take too long for people to realize, hey, we have less food this year than we had last year. And you know who suffers the most? It says the barley and wheat. For a denarius, a denarius is a day's wage, is a day's wage. One day's worth of work will be enough for a quart of wheat and three quarters of barley. Why? Barley's cheaper. Wheat is more expensive. But those are the basic things of life. Poor people are going to have it worst. People that have less will have even less. But don't damage the oil and the wine. The rich will continue to have the rich. Don't expect Jeff Bezos and Sucker Face and all these guys to, to suffer anything, right? They're not going to suffer anything, right? You know, these governments, they're not going to suffer. It's the, pe the people have less. We're going to have to suffer more. And there'll be a tremendous famine. Now, when you think of famine, who do you, what's the one character you think of most in the Bible? When you think of famines? Joseph. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. Now, let's turn to the book of Acts real quick. Joseph went through famine, and in the book of Acts, we're told something very interesting. Acts chapter 7, please. Acts chapter 7, verse 11. Acts chapter 7, verse 11. Who are we at here? Acts chapter 7, verse 11. Stephen is going to give a great history of what happened to the Jewish people. By the way, if you want to know the Old Testament, one way... To know it is read chapter 7 of Acts. He recounts what happened to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Chapter 11, I'm sorry, verse 7, cha uh, chapter 7, verse 11. A famine came all over Egypt and Canaan and, and great affliction with it. And our fathers could not find food. Now, this is about Joseph. Look at verse 9. The patriarchs came, and they became jealous of Joseph, and they sold him to slavery, and God was with them. And he rescued him from all of his afflictions and granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over all of Egypt and all the household. Now, a famine came over all of Egypt and Canaan, and great... Does anyone have a different translation in verse 11? Great affliction, says mine. Does anyone have a different one? 
Affliction? There came a dearth. A dearth? Okay. A little better English there. Yeah. Dearth? Affliction? Anybody have a different one? Okay. Uh, the word is tribulation. Tribulation. Philipsis. Mega Philipsis. Great tribulation came upon Joseph. And our fathers could not find food. It tells you something about famine. Look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24 again. Look at verse 21. Mega Philipsis is the word for great tribulation. Verse 21, Matthew 24. Somebody could read that one? It's the words of Jesus. Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Okay, same term. Great tribulation, mega thalipsis. Joseph had great tribulation. Wait a minute, that's in the Old Testament. Jesus said a great tribulation is coming in the future. Yes, they are connected. One more. Look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. Somebody can read that, 7, 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's right. These are believers who come out of the great tribulation are standing before the throne of God. Mega Thalipsis, same word. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. 2, 2, 2. This is a judgment on Thyatara and the false teachers that were going on in Thyatara. 2, 2, 2. Anybody have that one? Revelation 2, 2, 2. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery with her, and in a great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. That's right. So now we've tied four different passages through that one word. This is how we study the Bible. Find a passage in which that word relates to these different passages. That same word is there. And you have found a spiritual connection to all these different passages. The great tribulation is a, an event it is the last three and a half years of the, week of, the, of the last week of Daniel. It's the last three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel. It's called Great Tribulation. Now, Great Tribulation, there is a Great Tribulation that is coming, no doubt. But the other passages that we read show us that Joseph had his own Great Tribulation. So when we look at Joseph, it teaches us something about the Great Tribulation that's for the future. What was the one thing that we relate to Joseph? You answered earlier. Famine. famine. What did the Lord say was going to happen when the third seal is broken? It's going to be famine. How did Joseph behave? The whole story of Joseph, by the way, when you read Genesis, is kind of interesting. There's a bit about Abraham, a little bit about Isaac, a little bit about Jacob, and then a lot about Joseph. Anybody know why? I heard it. Okay, a little bit about Abraham, a little bit about Isaac. There's very small things about Isaac. A little bit more about Jacob. But then you've got chapter after chapter about Joseph. Why is such an emphasis on Joseph? It's going to be similar to Christ. He was a man of faith. Yeah, it was a man who entered into great tribulation. It is the generation that dealt with great tribulation. Abraham didn't have to deal with it. Although he did live with the famine, didn't he? Famine, and he went to Egypt, right? There's another famine that came in the book of Kings, right? With Elijah at the time. But this famine of Joseph is probably the most well-known one. It's the generation that went into the Great Tribulation that teaches us more things about Joseph than all the other patriarchs. The generation that entered into the Great Tribulation is the one we need to look at. Because it teaches us something about a future generation According to the Bible, Savi just read it, there'll be believers who come out of the great tribulation. Now, what does that teach us about, uh, about Joseph? How does it teach us about ourselves? There will be a Pharaoh. Joseph dealt with the Pharaoh. Pharaoh will be the type of the Antichrist. It will be an Antichrist. What did Pharaoh do when the... Well, backtrack a little bit. Joseph has a dream. Long story. You can read it on your own. Right? Chapter 37. Long story, but just summarize it. He sold into slavery, we're told that in Acts, yes. and he suffered great tribulation, and our forefathers, the children of Israel, had no food. 
But God sent Joseph ahead, the Bible says. But it didn't look, it look, they didn't look at it that way at first. He was sold into slavery. He worked for Potiphar, was lied about with that woman, was sent to prison. He's got the baker and the butler, right? And then they both have dreams. He interprets a dream, tells them, don't forget about me. As soon as they get out, they forget about Joseph. One dies, one lives. And then one day, they remember Joseph. And the Pharaoh has a dream. Seven lean years, uh, seven good years, seven lean years. He's represented by set, uh, cows, fat cows and lean cows. Mm-hmm. And they bring Joseph and he says, can you tell us about the dream? And he says, yes, I will tell you. The Lord has showed me. He is the interpreter of dreams, kind of like Daniel. And he tells them, Pharaoh, you're going to have seven good years, lots of food, and seven bad years of famine, real bad famine. So what I suggest, you save up to deal with the famine. And Pharaoh says, great idea, you're in charge. Right? That's what they do. You're a great idea, you're in charge. And Joseph prepared. And Joseph made all the requirements, right? He filled all the requirements to keep the food and whatever. They had great years. He kept some and he put them in big uh, containers and he supplied lots of food. And through his preparation, the whole world was fed, right? Even the children of Israel were kept. But what happened shortly after that, I'm summarizing quite a bit. You need to read it on your own. Genesis 37 is that when he set everything up, Pharaoh takes control. And he takes control of the supply lines. And he takes control of the food. And he said the people had to come and give their livestock to Pharaoh. Then they, could, they had to give their land to Pharaoh. Then they finally had nothing, but they still needed to eat. So they gave themselves to Pharaoh. I mean, ultimately, they just became slaves to Pharaoh again. Right? Because Pharaoh had control of the, uh, of the food supply. This is how the Great Tribulation is going to be. It's going to come through famine. War, of course, causes famine, by the way. The war of the red horse is going to bring great pain and suffering on the world. And the next thing that the world's going to be hit with will be great famine. And that famine that God is going to allow, right? It's going to show us, you know, through, through Joseph, it's going to show us how we're to deal with these things when it happens. Jesus said, uh, you will have tribulation. In this world, you have tribulation. You have persecution. You will have family issues, right? It's not just history. It's prophetic history, right? Things that will happen to, happen to Joseph. He had, did he have family problems? Yeah. Boy, did he ever, right? Yeah, he did. He had brothers that didn't like him, right? Did he have persecution? Yeah, they lied about him, right? And uh, in a smaller scale, Joseph lived in great tribulation with a famine. But the Bible says God was with him and God kept him, right? By the way, this, this is true also in the early church. In the book of Eph- uh, in, the, in, 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 in history, it says during the, in the city of Ephesus, which we have a letter to the church of Ephesus, but in the city of Ephesus, uh, in history, the Caesars would have this huge, giant, um, like an arch, mm-hmm. like an arch. And um, mm-hmm. you would have to go into the supermarket, as it were, the farmer's market at the time. You would have to go through this gate, and over the gate was the statue of Caesar. And you had to bow down and burn incense to Caesar and say, uh, Kaiser Cudius. In order to enter into the food market, you would have to enter through this arch, through this gateway, <laughs> bow down, burn incense, and say, Kaiser Kurios, Caesar is Lord. The Christians didn't do it. The Christians say, no, Christos is Lord. Christos Kurios, Jesus is Lord. They wouldn't bow down. Well, you can't enter in them. You can't have food. And the, and the believers in Ephesus had to deal with tremendous famine, right? During the Middle Ages. This happened during the Middle Ages. They had guilds. You know what a guild is? Guild? A guild, they had a certain trade, whether you were an artisan or you were a a, a potter, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, right? You had a guild, and each guild had a god. Each guild had a god. This is the whole Catholic thing about, uh, you know, there's a saint for everything. There's a saint for travel. There's a saint for... You know, the, the workmen's union, there's a saint for the <laughs> chauffeurs, there's a, there's a saint for the truck drivers. You know, I, they used to tell because my middle name, it, it's Antonio. They said, oh, there's Santo Antonio, Saint Anthony. He's the traveling, you know, I think he was a traveling saint. I don't know, one of them. And, you know, you just put a little on the dashboard and, you know, you just, 
you just commit yourself to, to that saint. But that, that doesn't come from the Catholic Church necessarily. It came from Roman ideas. They had guilt. Well, if you were a Christian and you worked as a, a butcher or, or whatever, a bricklayer, you have to go to these guilds and you would have to honor and worship the, the, the gods. You have to worship the gods in order to work in that, in that guild. Well, the Christians couldn't work. So what do you do? Well, the last days is going to be like that. Christian won't, Christians won't be able to participate in idolatry and immorality. They won't be able to participate in the economy of the world because it was all, it's going to be all based on wickedness. And, uh, but the Bible says the Antichrist will take over the economies of the world. No one will be able to buy or sell without his number. Right? Turn to the book of Acts real quick. Book of Acts chapter 11. A lot to write today, but um, Acts, Acts. Acts chapter 11. Don't worry, we're just getting started. Just getting warmed up now. Acts chapter 11, verse 27. Yes. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them was Agabus. Now Agabus is a very important uh, prophet in the book of Acts. It shows you that there were prophets in the early church. And he has a prophecy. He also has another prophecy later on for Paul. But he has a prophecy and began to indicate by the Holy Spirit that there will be a great famine all over the world at that time. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. During the reign of Claudius. Now, according to Roman history, in the reign of Claudius, there were four great famines. During the, great, uh, during the uh, um, reign of Claudius, there were four great famines. I'm going to read to you uh, Autonius. Autonius was a Roman historian. He says, there was a scarcity of food, which was the result of a bad harvest that occurred during the span of several years. What I just read to you was not Marco's own words. This is the uh, famous Autonius historian about the life of Claudius, chapter 18. The life of Claudius, chapter 18, if you want to read it. It's kind of boring stuff, a lot of boring stuff, but pretty interesting stuff at the same time. There was going to be a scarcity of food. Four of them. This is one of them. Luke tells us, and here in Acts, that this happened during the reign of Claudius. There was four. Now, I don't know which one this one is. Maybe the second one, maybe the middle one. We don't know. But it says, and then the proportion, verse 29, and the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to say contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And as they did this, they sent it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So Barnabas and Saul were there in the church, and it says, Saul and Barnabas, you take all these food, all these supplies to the church in Jerusalem, to the believers in Jerusalem, because there's going to be a great famine. They're going to suffer a lot. Let's send them some food. And through two witnesses, they send two witnesses down to Jerusalem. Chapter 12. And about this time, Herod the king laid hands on some of those who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Famine? Persecution. By who? Herod. And we're going to find out a little bit about Herod here. Then he puts Peter in jail at the time of Passover. And then the Lord delivers Peter, praise God. But then uh, I'm going to shoot down a little more, just so we, for the sake of time. Look down, uh, verse 20, verse 20, same chapter. Herod killed James. Herod put Peter in prison. Herod began to mistreat the church. Saul and Barnabas are distributing food to the people, taking care of the saints, encouraging the saints. All right? Remember, this teaches us about great tribulation. What to do? What's your character going to be like? They're going to mistreat Christians. They're going to kill some of them. There's going to be witnesses. There's going to be people going to be offering food, and they're going to be offering care. God's people are going to take care of each other. The Bible says to be a wise servant who gives the proper food at the proper time. Not just physical food, but Paul and Barnabas were there to encourage the church in Jerusalem during tough times. Verse 20. Now, Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and of Sidon, and with one accord they came to him, having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, for they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. There was famine, and Herod was angry with Tyre and Sidon, and then they made a deal for peace, peace and safety, because the country needed food 
by Herod. On the appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, Josephus tells us it was complete silver. It was a shiny apparel. It was a shiny coat. And he was by uh, Caesarea, up by the coast. Beautiful area, Mediterranean. The sun coming off the Mediterranean Sea, shining on a, a silver outfit. He would have looked like a brilliant being. He would have looked... <laughs> he would have looked like Elton John. Very good. <laughs> he would have looked like a god, which that's what he was trying to be like. He took his seat on the rostrum, on the court, uh, like, a, like a judgment seat, like a throne, and he began delivering an address to them, and the people kept saying, the voice of a god and not of a man. So a man takes the throne, places himself in the throne, and people are calling him a god. What is that? Who is that? It's the Antichrist. What is Herod in control of? The food. You have to make peace with them to get food. What's the church doing at this time? Helping each other. Persecution. But Peter is delivered. Peter is delivered. Peter's taken out. The Lord takes him out of prison. Brings him out. And immediately an angel, of the Lord, uh, an, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and he died. Right there, judgment, boom, falls upon him. This is not just history, biblical history, but this is Josephus writes about it. It says he was eaten by worms, exactly the same what the Bible says. It was a terrible disease, very painful for a few days. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. The word of the Lord will prevail. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they were fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. So Paul dealt with famine. Oh, and then an antichrist. It comfort the church and persecution. Jesus said there will be famines, there will be earthquakes, there will be very difficult things that will happen. Turn to the book of Zechariah chapter 6 now. Zechariah 6. Back to Zechariah again. By the way, when Claudius, four famines during Claudius, the book of Acts tells us there was one famine there. History tells us there was four. Who was the next Caesar after Claudius? Anybody know? Nero. Nero came into power and he took control of the food supply line and it's in the early Christians, he was the first Caesar that the early Christians began to associate the number 666 to a Caesar. That's what his number added up. His name added up to 666, and they call him the beast. Absolutely. He took control of the supply line. Four famines. Claudius, you're out of here. Herod comes into power, takes control of the food line, begins to persecute the Christians, kills Peter, kills Paul, persecutes many Christians, sets, a, sets, the, sets the Rome on fire and blames it on the Christians. Yes? You said something, you mentioned something about there would be somebody to, in that time, that will actually supply somewhat food for the believers, and not only spiritual food, or not only physical food, but spiritual food as well? Yeah. So what, can you elaborate on that? Like, like there will be somebody to aid that, that part of us when that famine comes along? Or does that refer to, like, maybe there might be somebody that has means to a large amount of food that will supply the believers at the end, the end time? Somehow, some way, God's going to get you Food. God can do. God can feed the, with. God can feed you through the ravens. God can feed you through the brook. Right. God can feed you through many different ways. But the way He's going to do it, He's going to comfort. He's going to bring comfort among the church. Comfort among the church. Right. Now, spiritual food. Yes. Physical food. Yes. Uh, is it going to be tough for the believers? Yes. But God's going to prevail. God is going to prevail. Amen. Just like you see Paul and Barnabas after they're done with their mission, boom, they, they got done, they left. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yes. Is that wonderful? Yeah. 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 And he got to reign and he became the reign. And of course, we know the story of Joseph doesn't end there, right? There's a reconciliation with his brothers. They don't recognize him the first time. He reveals himself the second time. 
right? Joseph reveals himself to the Jewish people, to the sons of Israel, the second time, and they realize he's not a Gentile, he's not an Egyptian, he's one of us, he's our brother, right? That's what's going to happen to the Jewish people. They're going to look upon him when they have peers, and just like they did with Joseph, they wept bitterly. They're going to weep bitterly that they have rejected Jesus for all these years, and they will come to faith. It's all there. It's in the story of Joseph. Absolutely in the story of Joseph. Zechariah chapter 6. Now we see another interesting thing. I lifted up my eyes and again I looked and behold four chariots coming forth from between two mountains. And the mountains were bronze mountains. And the first chariots were red horses. Second chariot, black horses. Uh Uh-oh. Same thing. With the uh, third chariot, a white horse. Fourth chariot, a dapple horse. Like a speckled horse, right? Then I spoke to the angel, said, who's speaking with me? And it says, what are these, my Lord? And it said, the angel said to me, the, the angel replied, these are the four spirits of heaven going forth that they're standing before the Lord of all the earth. With, uh, with, uh, with one of the black horses are going forth toward the north country, and the white one goes after the black horses, while the dapple horse or the dapple ones go to the south country. And what does this all mean? Now we can go on, Zechariah 6, but I'll just stop there for the sake of brevity, sake of time. Four chariots from the mountains, two mountains. Now, in, in, in the Old Testament, whenever you see two mountains, it's a picture of blessings and curses, right? In the Old Testament, Joshua had to stand before um, two mountains and yell blessings from one mountain and the curse of the law from the other mountain. And the people were standing in between the two mountains had to choose. Are they going to choose the obedience and blessings of God or the disobedience and the curse of the law? And they all said, of course, we want God's blessings. We're going to keep the law, which they didn't. But that's what that means. It comes between two mountains and it goes forward. That was in the Valley of Shechem. Now we got the horses. Almost identical colors. Red, black, white, dappled, speckled. Right? Think of the speckle as that green one in the, in, in, in the book of Revelation. The black one goes to the north. And who goes after the black one? The white one. The white one goes after it. Right? The Antichrist, now Revelation tells us who they are. The white horse is the Antichrist. The black horse is famine. Famine is going to go to the north. And the Antichrist is going to go after it. Why does the Antichrist want to go after the famine? You got it. He's going to control the food supply line. He's going to try to control it to take advantage of a massive collapse. Well, what's the north? Biblically, it's anything above Jerusalem, anything above Israel, the northern hemisphere. Don't worry about it. We're not in the northern hemisphere. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. (laughs) There's going to be something that's going to happen. I don't know if it's Europe. I don't know if it's everything, but it's going to be a global famine. A global famine is going to hit the northern hemisphere. And somebody with a lot of means is going to take advantage of it. He's going after the the black one. And he's going to make war with the dapple horse, with the speckle horse. Now, what's a speckled horse and a white horse? Have you ever seen that in Scripture? Speckled and white and all kinds of stuff happening. Anybody have any clue? Uh, Jacob Joseph. Yes, let's turn to Genesis chapter 29. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 29. (laughs) Now, the Bible is not history. It's future history. The Bible is just random chapters put together. It's an interlinked system of information. It's all there. Genesis chapter 29, verse 14. 29, 14. We'll start there. Laban said to Jacob, Surely you're bone of my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with them a month. Now Laban, of course, had two daughters. What are their names? Rachel Rachel and Leah. That's right. The Laban said to Jacob, because you're my relative, and he was, Laban was uh, Rebekah's brother. Because you're my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now, Laban's had two daughters, Leah, and the younger one was Rachel. And Leah's eyes were weak. Another story, another time, we'll let you know what that means. Uh, lots of controversy, whether she was not a good-looking girl or anything like that, or whether her appearance was... Uh, somewhat humble, uh, homely, uh, lots of different variations. There's probably something to do with that. It was probably, she was probably less attractive than Rachel. 
Put it that way. That's the most common one, but it's a very difficult one to translate. I will serve you for seven years. I'm sorry, but Rachel was beautiful, form and face. So there's the, 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 the just the post, right? One was beautiful, the other one was weak to the eyes. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, and, she, and he said, I will serve you for seven years. For your, for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban, it is said, it is better that I give her to you than to give it to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served for seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to, uh, they seemed to him but a few days. Right? When you loved her, when he seemed to you for a very short time. Because he loved her. Does that happen to you, Art? You met Yolanda, it just seemed like days, right? It seemed like days. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this Bible study is going to unravel very quickly. Right? Jacob served for seven years. And Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, for my time is completed that I may go into her. Laban gathered all the men of, play, uh, of the place and made a feast. Now in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him. And Jacob went into her and had relationships with her. Laban said to his maid, Zilpah to his daughter Leah as maid. And it came about in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is it you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? But Laban said, it is not the practice of our, uh, of our place to marry off the younger before the firstborn. Complete this week with me and we'll give you the other for the service and you shall serve with me for another seven years. Seven. Notice the word week there. It's the same as seven years. In, in Hebrew, it's that idea. A word week, uh, Shabbat, Shabbat, we get the word Sabbath. It also means sevens. It doesn't mean a week necessarily, it just means sevens. Seven days, seven weeks. You have different things in, 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 in the Hebrew calendar. You have uh, weeks, you have seven sevens, you have weeks of sevens, you have weeks uh, of seven days, you have seven weeks, you have seven years. There's all these ideas of sevens in the Bible, right? And it all comes from the word Sabbath, the idea of sevens. So a seven could be seven days. A seven could be seven weeks. Or it could be seven years. And here we're told if seven years, but it's also synonymous with complete this week, it says. Complete these sevens, mm -hmm. these seven years, and we'll, give you, uh, and we'll give you the other for the service, and you shall serve with me for another seven years. Jacob did so and completed for her week. There is another one. Again, Sabbath or Shabbat, a week, seven years, uh, sevens. And he gave his daughter Rachel as his wife. Now, what is this story about? Well, let me tell you about Laban. He was a wicked man. Laban in Hebrew means, anybody know what it means? Laban. It means white. White. It means white. The white one. All right. The white one makes a deal with Jacob. For how long? What does he do with that covenant that he makes with them? He breaks it. He breaks it. False peace, false security. Let's make a deal. The white one makes a deal with the Jewish people, the, the, the father of the nations, Jacob, and he breaks the covenant, the one that he made for seven years. The white one makes a covenant, and for one week, seven years, and he breaks it. Daniel, 70th week of Daniel. Uh, Daniel 9 tells us that the man of peace, so to speak, the wicked one, Daniel calls it the prince who is to come, makes a covenant with the people of Israel for seven years. Almost identical word as in, in Genesis. Seven years. Right? Seven. Remember, there was a, a proportion to the Jewish people for uh, so many weeks. Right? They have 70 weeks. It will be for Jerusalem. It will be to bring reconciliation, to make the end of sin. And 69 of those weeks were fulfilled when Jesus went to that cross. And 69 weeks were fulfilled when Jesus rode into Jerusalem. 69 of those weeks, 69 periods of seven years were fulfilled. 483 years. There's still one week left to fulfill. It's called the 70th week of Daniel. Still left out there. When you see this picture of one week, it's, a, it's ultimately a picture of the big one. The one that's coming. Laban, the white one, the white horse, goes after the black one in the north. Makes a peace with Jerusalem. Makes a peace with the Jewish people. And then he breaks it, exactly what Daniel says. In the middle of that week, the middle of that seven weeks, of that, se uh, of that 70th week of Daniel, he cuts it in half. That's what the book of Revelation deals with, the three and a half years. 
not the seven, the three and a half, because he breaks the covenant. And the Bible says he declares himself to be God in the temple of God. This is a picture of it. But what is in the midst of it? Famine. He goes, Zechariah says, he goes after the white one. I'm sorry, he goes after the black one. The white one goes after the black one. There's a great famine. Now what about the speckled horse? You've got to go to chapter 30, verse 27. Jacob works for Laban for seven more years. He has children, Leah, Rachel. He has their maids. You know, they, they both had a handmaid. So he has children with them too. A whole mess, right? But then he works for Laban and he says, look, I, I got to leave. I got family. I got kids. You know, times are tough. I got to get going. He's, no, 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 stay with me. Stay with me. Verse 27, Laban said to him, now if it pleases you to stay with me, I have, divi- uh, I have divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. Because Jacob stayed with Laban, God blessed Laban. You know, he was a wicked man. But then he makes a deal. Jacob makes a deal with Laban. He says, look, I will keep the speckled ones, the goats and the sheep, the speckled ones, I will keep. You can have the solid colors. You can have the other ones. And he makes a deal. And God blesses Jacob, and he has more speckled than Laban had the solid colors. So here's a perfect example of what's going to happen. They're going to make a deal, but God is not going to let Laban get to Jacob. He breaks the covenant, God blesses Jacob and redeems Jacob, and Jacob gets out of there. Same thing is going to happen. They're going to make a covenant, but through God's wisdom, he's going to save a remnant. There's going to be a remnant who the Antichrist is not going to touch. That's the remnant that will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will look upon him who they have peers. God is going to keep a remnant of the Jews. They're not going to be touched by the Antichrist. They're going to be refined through the fire, says Zechariah 13. Yes. I just wanted to make a point. Yeah. Um, after um, after uh, Joseph uh, forgave his, uh, his family, there was a time between uh, his death uh, where um, his, his, his brothers and his offspring, they, they were protected. Yeah, absolutely. By, uh, by the Lord. From, from, from Egypt. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. God will keep his remnant. God will keep his people. And you see how even Laban tried to make a deal with them. God honored Jacob. Same thing is going to happen. God is going to keep his people away from the clutches of the Antichrist, especially the Jewish people. Remember, once the church has been removed by the rapture, God is going to deal with Israel. The remnant will still be here, and then God's going to deal with them. And the Antichrist will try to destroy them, but God's not going to let it happen. He's going to preserve the faithful ones. Yes. Okay, so far so good? Yes. All right. So we have the chariots. We have the horses. We have the white one. We have Laban. We have a covenant that's broken. We have a famine that breaks up in the north. We have the black horse that goes up and the white horse goes up there. We have Herod. We have Nero. We have Joseph. We have Pharaoh. All these things. And go back to Revelation 6 and we're only in verse 9. So don't worry. Revelation 6. So the north and the south, all those things, right? The north is known for technology and prosperity. Something's going to happen up in that northern area. That's what the Bible tells us will happen. Now, the north is going to get hit with the famine. The south is going to give him some power during this famine, during this time. Verse 7. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard a voice, the four living creatures saying, Come, I looked and behold, an ashen horse, a pale green horse. He who sat in it had the names of death and Hades was following him. Authority was given to them over the fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, famine, pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Sickness and death. Look what it comes. It comes with death, Hades. It comes with the killing of the sword, with famines, and with pestilence. It's a replay of the other horses, but in more intensity now. The final horse carries all the other two horses, war, famine, and now you have the word pestilence. There's going to be a terrible things happen upon the earth. Why is God allowing this to happen? Why is God unleashing these things upon the earth? Remember, he breaks the seals. Why is he doing this? More and more people today are going to food banks. More and more people today are dependent on the government. 
more and more people today have less and less than what they had 10, 20, 15 years ago. Bad policies by the government, yep. Stupid policies, yep. Judgment, yep. Bad, corrupt leaders, yep. But why is God allowing this? Why is God the first cause of all this? He's trying to wake people up. He's trying to wake people up. When will people listen? You know when people listen? When it hits their God. When it hits the pocketbook. Why are most people more clutching these days? Money, right? They're trying to hold it to themselves. But when it hits the... Most people didn't, had no idea what was going on in the Middle East. It's $5 a gallon now. Yeah. Marco, what's going on? They literally, they call me. What happened? Right. And I said, well, I've been talking about it for like years, two years, three years. Uh, but when did you notice? Well, I showed up. It was $5. And it was a big line. Well, the beginnings of sorrow. Just the beginning. Yeah. Don't worry about it now. All right? You're probably going to get some gas later. Probably a little more expensive. But don't, yeah, exactly. Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, down the coast, Texas, right? More and more people are going to notice this. God is waking people up. The only way to wake them up is when things get tough, right? And pestilence. Pestilence are going to continue. There's going to be more pestilence. Now, whether it's man engineered or just naturally, ca- naturally causing the environment, Jesus said it would happen. Pestilence in the world. What's going to happen now? People are going to have to trust God, not their government, not, not the hospitals, not anything, but trust God. Trust God for their survival, their safety. Now, the fifth seal is interesting because when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because of the testimony which they had uh, maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you, not re- will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each one a white robe. And they were told that they should rest for a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed as they had been would be completed. Now the fifth seal. What's the fifth seal? Jesus said there will be persecution. Right? Now the fifth seal is interesting. It's not from earth. It's a vision of heaven. Yes. John is given four visions. Or it's the same vision, but four views of the seals. Four different seals on earth. He looks up to heaven. He's in the courtroom. And now under the altar, under the throne of God, there is the people of God who have suffered, persecuted believers. And they say, how long, O Lord? Remember, wars, famines, pestilence, false Christs have come into the world. How long, O Lord? Now, this sounds like a psalmist. I got a list of psalms. We, don't, we won't go through them tonight. I got a list of psalms that has that phrase, how long, O Lord? Several of them. Psalm 18, right? Psalm 13, Psalm 79, Psalm 94, Psalm 74. All have that crying out to God, how long, O Lord? Well, what's their cause? What's, what, what are they crying out for? Lord, how long are you going to uh, refrain from judging and avenging our blood? They're crying out for vengeance and vindication. People want their vindication. These are the people of God. These are Old Testament believers and New Testament believers. And they have suffered. They have suffered tremendously. They have been faithful, right? It's a prayer of the saints. A prayer of the saints that's going to make the seals relevant. They're not immediately answered. God doesn't say, now I'm going to judge. He says, wait a little longer. Now the seals, this gives you a perspective of the seals. The seals are not the wrath of God. The seals are not the wrath of God. Remember, God said these uh, these things are going to be judgment on nations. They're going to be God giving them what they want. You want war? You want evil? I want to take peace from the earth. Well, pastor, how do you know there's not the, the wrath of God? Well, it's, there's not mentioned the wrath of God yet, but his people are suffering. Yes. If this is the wrath of God, then we've got to deal with other verses that say we will not suffer the wrath of God. Yes. This is not the wrath of God. This is the wrath of Satan, yes. the wrath of the Antichrist. Who is putting him to death? Seemingly, the white horse has already been in power now. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, these martyrs are under the altar crying out to God. Something has happened on the earth. Persecution has unleashed. Persecution has been unleashed. 
and the martyrs are crying out to God. But their prayer is not answered right away. It says you have to wait until the rest of those who are going to be killed are going to have to, you're going to have to wait until their number, the number of their brethren that are to be killed, would be completed. There's a number that God has in, in place of persecuted believers. When that number it meets, then the wrath comes. And we're going to see the wrath in a moment. I've got to finish quickly so we will not hear any more than what we have to do. But here it's given to them a consolation. You rest for a while. You rest for a while because you've suffered enough. And it says, you, uh, verse, yeah, verse 13, 12. Not 12, sorry. And they were given to, they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants is completed. They were to die. You don't have to suffer anymore. You're before the Lord. You're in the presence of God. You'll be vindicated. All that you've said will come true. God is good and God is true. And the world doesn't like it. And they did it to the Lord. They put him to death. They're going to put it to, they're going to put to death his people. Jesus said, if they hated me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Mm-hmm. Right. A, a student is not greater than his teacher, That's than right. his master. Um, those who have died will be vindicated, right? Jesus was innocent, but he took our place. I'm not innocent. I deserve it. Jesus didn't deserve it. But even when he was afflicted, he did not revile. He did not attack them, right? Jesus did not revile. He didn't protest. He committed himself to the will of God, it says, to the faithful creator. Well, this is what is being told here to the martyrs. You leave it to God. You rest. There are more to come. There's more people that are going to have to die. Um, but Jesus is going to have the number in mind. There's only a, a certain number that God has in mind, and nothing else was going to happen. Now, God raised Jesus from the dead to vindicate him. The Bible says he was vindicated by the resurrection. All that Jesus said was true when Jesus was raised from the dead. People have nothing against Jesus now. Everything he said was true. He rose from the dead. Well, same thing's going to happen with believers. Everything that we tell people is true. They might put us to death. For the reality of the gospel and the truth of, Je- the truth of Jesus. But my friend, don't, don't, don't let that worry. I said, Lord, I lived my life as a faithful person. I gave, I gave myself to you. And this is what I get. I get death. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you get to be with him. Exactly. Which is far better. Well, that doesn't make yeah. me feel better. Mm-hmm. Well, don't worry about the vindication. He will vindicate you. You're going to live on the earth again. You're going to reign for a thousand years with Jesus. And then eternity comes. Right? You're going to be all right. Don't fear those who can kill the body, Jesus said. Fear him who can now can both kill the body and throw the body into hell. That's what you got to fear. Aren't you greater than the sparrows, Jesus said? Doesn't he know the numbers on your head? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's on the same context. Don't, don't fear the one who killed the body. Fear God. And he says, aren't you greater? Aren't you more important than sparrows? Aren't you more, doesn't God know the numbers on your head? He will take care of you. There's no fear. By the way, if you fear God, you have nobody else to fear. If you fear God, you have nothing else to fear, not even death. If you fear God, you're the most free man and woman in the whole world. You don't don't have any fears. If you fear the Lord, you have no fears. If the book of Revelation gives you fear, there's something that still needs to be worked out. Perfect love, cast out all fear, right? If love has not been, if you still have fear in your relationship with the Lord, not, not a fear of God, but the fear of something happening, then love hasn't been perfected in you. There still needs to be work to be done. Now, there's things concerning. Don't get me wrong. There's very deep things concerning in this passage and other passages we're going to read. But it's not fear. At least it shouldn't be fear. And if there is fear, I need to take it to the Lord and say, Lord, has your love not been perfected in me? Have I not gone close to you lately? Because if there's fear, then there's something that needs to be changed. Now, Jesus said about the woman, the widow, who went to the wicked judge, and she said, vindicate me before my enemies. And the wicked judge gave that widow her vindication. Why? Because she kept bothering him. And the wicked judge says, look, this woman, she's not going to leave me alone. He says, I don't care for men. I don't care for the law or anything. I'm just going to give her what she, because she keeps asking me. And then Jesus says, how much more will your heavenly father not vindicate you, those who cry out to him day and night. He will vindicate you. He will bring justice. This is what the martyrs are asking. Lord, are you, is there any justice in this world? 
Yeah. Why the wicked people get away with things? Why would a wicked man die in peace on his bed, but the, the righteous missionary gets beheaded? Where's the justice in that? Anybody have a problem with that? Has anybody dealt with that in their own hearts and said, Lord, this just doesn't seem right, doesn't seem yes. fair. Yep. Why are good people, godly people, not, none of us are good. I'm not, not saying, we all have some fault in it. We all deserve it. That's the first pride thing, right? But if you try to live a godly life, you're going to get the short end of the stick in this world. Guaranteed. Yes. You try to live a godly life in this world, you're going to get the short end of the stick. Anybody still want to stay in the Bible study? You're free to go, right? <laughs> right? Um, you're going to get the short end of the stick. Would you still follow Jesus? Knowing that you're not going to get, you know, if you wanted fame, glory, power in this world, follow Lucifer. Follow Satan. He's going to give it to you. He's going to give you what you want in this world. You want the world? Follow Antichrist. Just follow Antichrist. He'll give it to you. You want fame, power, glory, women, whatever you want, he'll give it to you. You want righteousness? You want eternal life? You want, you want the heavenly glories? You want the crown of thorns? That's what you're going to get, right? You're going to get the crown of thorns. You're going to get a cross. But then life everlasting and vindication from the Lord, right? We have that hope. We have the hope of eternal life. We have the guaranteed victory from the Lord. Here, the, the martyrs, you want God to say, well, that's it. You know, they're doing this to my people. I'm coming right down and destroying and get everything done. He says, wait a while. Why, God, why, why is God waiting? Patience. Patience of God. Exactly. You ever heard the long suffering of the Lord? He will allow his own people to suffer a measure for the sake of the lost, to bring them to Christ. He'll even put his own son on a cross so sinners like us, he'll put his own body, his own son's body, and be destroyed for the sake of you and me, wicked people, who would bow the knee to Jesus and become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's how much he's willing. So the fact that he's putting his body, the body of Christ, the church, through affliction, he's allowing it, as it were. He's taking peace from the earth and allowing his, for the sake of the gospel. Remember, Jesus said the gospel will go to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. God still wants the gospel to go out. But what's going to happen to people when they go out and meet wicked people? They, they might get affliction. They might get tribulation. They might get killings. They might get, they might get all that stuff. Does it mean it's wrong? No, it means it's necessary. Yes. To live as Christ, to die as gain. Hallelujah. My friend, you serve Jesus, and even if it costs your life, you won. You won, you win, you gain. When the unbeliever loses, when the unbeliever dies, they lose. It's a negative for them. When the believer dies, it's a gain. It's a gain. You got to think biblically. We have to stop thinking worldly. Worldly people say, well, if I do, who's gonna, what's going to happen to all my stuff? And you know, all the stuff I work for. It's a negative. <laughs> to the lost, to the wicked, to the unbelievers, it's a negative. They're going to lose. To us, we gain. Amen. And if we remain on the earth, we have Christ. Eternal. You can't lose either way. You're going to have Christ one way or the other. You're going to gain Christ. If you die, you'll be with him, which is far better, Paul said. But until then, the martyrs are not dead, by the way. They're alive. Did you notice that? They're not dead. They're alive. They're under the altar. What have they lost? Nothing. Well, they lost this world. And by the way, it's going to take that. We're going to have to lose the world. Yeah. Yeah, what does a prophet of man if he gained the whole world and loses his own soul? These men have not, these men and women have lost nothing. In Romans 8, it says, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Can persecution, Hallelujah. death, right? Famines, pestilence, sword can separate. No, none of these things. Well, here's a perfect example. They've gone through the difficulties and they've gained Christ. They did not, they were not separated from the love of God. By the way, Romans 8, when we talk about more than conquerors, we put it in terms of well, we're going to overcome this and the difficulty and trials. Yes, that applies to that. But you know what it applies to the most? The context of Romans 8 is when creation, it groans right now, waiting for the revelation of the sons of men, of the sons of God, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. It's an apocalyptic, it's a revelatory uh, passage of Scripture. It says that the creation is even groaning for the end. The end's going to come. And he even says, that's right. It even says, 
uh, um, we are convinced, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Amen. For these he foreknew, he also, he predestined them, he justified them, he sanctified them, and he also glorified them. The resurrection. It's a passage about the resurrection. Can anything separate us from the love of God? No. no. Neither depth, nor height, nor any created thing can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are more than conquerors. But notice the conquering is in death. Where did Jesus conquer? In his death. In his death and resurrection. These believers are going to be resurrected. By the way, resurrection is coming. We're going to get to the end right now. Uh, verse, verse 12. Look, and he, uh, he looked and behold the sixth seal. And there was a great earthquake. And then the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the skies fell to the earth, a fig tree cast under uh, its unripe figs, shaken by a great wind, and the sky was split apart like a scroll when it rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave free man hid themselves in the caves, and among the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us. From the presence of him who sits on the throne. And notice the word. We're introduced to a new term in the book of Revelation. The wrath of the Lamb. No longer thalipsis, tribulation. Now we get orge, wrath. Orge, wrath. For the great day of the wrath right, has come. And who is able to stand? The end of the age has come. Jesus is about to come. But he comes with signs. Notice the sign, the sixth seal. There was great earthquake, and there was a sign in the heavens. The sun will turn into darkness, and the moon turn to blood. What is that a picture of? Well, it's not even a picture. It's a direct quote from the book of Joel. It said there'll be signs in the heavens. The, earth, the, the, the sun will turn to darkness, and the moon into blood before the great day of the Lord, quoted in the book of Acts. Peter says, this is what Joel said. Joel said that God will pour out his spirit before the day of the Lord. God has been pouring out his spirit. And then Peter went on and he quoted from Joel and he says, there'll be great signs, pillars of smoke, signs in the heaven. The sun will not give its light. The moon will not give its light before the great terrible day of the Lord. The day, of the, the, the day of the Lord is about to come. It says, hide us from the wrath. Is about to come. Literally in Greek, is about to come. Has come doesn't mean it's been happening. It means it's about to happen. It's about to be unleashed. Yes. The seals is not the wrath. Otherwise, it would be saying the wrath of God has been happening for the last five seals, right? The wrath of God is about to come. It's coming. Hide us now, right? But there's signs, heavenly signs. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. We'll be done. We'll be done with this. Matthew 24. Notice the sign. Matthew chapter 24. Look at verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, when all the things that Jesus has been talking about, great tribulation, first, uh, that was verse 15 and 17. In those days... The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The sun will be darkened darken and the moon will not give its light. And the stars, of, uh, the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heavens will be shaken. And there will be the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the sky. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. You know when Jesus is about to come? It tells you there. The moon and the sun will stop giving its light. Literally, Joel says, the, the sun will turn to darkness and the moon will turn to blood. But Joel said it's before the day of the Lord. Yes, Jesus is coming for the day of the Lord. Amen. But what's going to happen right before the day of the Lord? Because there's something interesting. Look at, look at uh, you keep your finger in Matthew, but in Revelation chapter... Chapter, chapter 8, look at Revelation 8, 1. We don't have the seven seals. There's seven seals on this scroll, but the seventh seal is not broken into chapter 8, verse 1. 
And the Lamb broke the seventh seal, and there were silence in heaven for about a half an hour. I don't even know how that works. There's no time in eternity. How did they measure half hour, right? Chapter 8, verse 1. Se- so what happens in between chapter 6 and chapter 8? Well, well chapter 7, right? That's easy. What's chapter 7 all about? We're going to have to find out next month. But it's something that Jesus said will happen. Before the seventh seal is open, before the wrath of God is poured out, Matthew 24, 31. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. Peter, uh, Paul calls it the trump of God. And they will gather together. The word is episunagage. Episunagage. Anybody know what that is? Found is in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm sorry, epis, episexusin. Sorry, this was episexusin, meaning to gather around next to. To gather around next to. Paul uses the same word, episunagage, with the different case endings. Where it says, regarding the coming of the Lord and our gathering together with him. He's speaking of the rapture. He is going to rapture us and gather us together at the trump of God, at the last trump. He will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds of the earth, from one end of heaven to the other. And then chapter 8 begins. So what's going to happen to God's people in between the rapture of the church and the pouring out of his wrath? Chapter 7. God is going to tell us next month what is exactly (laughs) going to happen. He is going to take his people and he's going to put his people to be continued. (laughs) He is going to put his people before the throne. So have you read it? These are the ones who have come out of mega thalipsis, great tribulation. They have come out of the famines. They have come out of the persecution. They have come out of the wars. They have come out of these terrible wrath of Satan and the wrath of the Antichrist. And here they're now before the throne. They're now before God's place. And on the seventh seal, it's going to be open. Chapter 8, verse 1. But in chapter 7, it's called an interlude. There's a pause. There's a pause. Chapter 6 should follow chapter 8, or chapter 8 should follow chapter 6, but it doesn't. There's a whole chapter, chapter 7, in which God seals his people Israel, 144,000 Jews, and he brings the church before his throne in Revelation chapter 7. And you'll find the church praising God, and it says, of every tribe, tongue, and nation, and people. So what's going to happen before then? God is going to take care of his people. Before the wrath is poured out, he will have his people before the throne. And it says in chapter 7, I'll I'll read this so we can finish. In chapter 7, for the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd. We're going to have our shepherd with us. Chapter 7, verse 17. And he will guide them to springs of water of life. What does that sound like? This Psalm 23. Yeah, that's right. And God will wipe every tear from Amen. their eyes. Hallelujah. Straight out of Isaiah. Amen. Isaiah 26, that God will wipe every tear, will conquer death, and there'll be no longer any suffering or pain to God's people because they'll be taken care of by God. Amen. God is going to take care of them. So, very simple. Up to the sixth seal, God's people have suffered tremendously. The world has suffered tremendously. But the world is in for still the wrath of God. God will remove his people in between the sixth and seventh seal. When the moon turns into the sun turns into darkness and the moon into blood, straight out of Joel, straight out of Matthew 24, Revelation 6, keep those three things in mind. They don't contradict. They fit perfectly in harmony. There'll be signs in the heavens. God's people will be gathered, taken up to the throne room of God. Then the wrath will come. But it all happens at the coming of Jesus. Jesus comes twice. First coming, second coming. His second coming is to rescue his people and bring the judgment of God upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world. The nations are going to get a heavy dose of judgment. Now the judgments begin. Now Revelation 8 says the judgment of God 
will begin. These are the judgments of God. These are the wrath. Different, completely different word, orge. We're not dealing with thalipsis anymore. Thalipsis means tribulation. Tribulation is over. Believers have been rescued. We will not suffer anymore. Praise Jesus. Orge now is for the nations. Yes. It's for the Antichrist. It's for the people that will follow a false messiah. Then the, the, the anger of the Lord will come upon them. Why? Because God has had enough. The mystery of God will be revealed. What's the mystery? How is God going to get us to eternal life? How is God going to get sinful people into heaven? The mystery of God will be over. There'll be no more mystery. God will have vindicated his son, us, before the world. And they would say, Savi was right. Joel was right. Dana was right. Unfortunately, it'll be too late for them. This is why, my friend, as we finish, Jesus said, the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the whole world. My friend, do all that you can. With all the means that you can, with all the time that you can. Yes. To let people know before it's too late. Amen. Don't waste your time. Hallelujah. Great missionary Jim Allen said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's right. We cannot lose it. We cannot lose it. Go and encourage others. Amen. Don't take days off anymore. It's much too valuable. Too much time has been wasted. But all that your resources and money and time that you've been given, use it for the glory of God and for the salvation of your family. Time is running short. I don't mean to be an alarmist. I'm not. A lot of times I, I, I ponder and think a lot more than what I think I should. <laughs> uh, but you can learn the Bible. You can start learning the Bible today. Don't put it off anymore. Yes. Get to know the scriptures. You're going to need it. Yes. You're going to need every, every measure of every word that is there. Amen. It's life and it's peace. Yes. Get on with the work. Yes. Get on with the work. Amen. Too much is given, much is required. Yes. We have a lot that we've been given. Amen. Um, missionaries that go out to different parts of the world, Amen. they'll tell you, a lot of people don't even have Bible studies in the rest of the world. They don't have Bible studies. There's a need for missionaries, a need for people to do evangelism. Um, but there's a need to feed people God's word. So do all that you can with all the means that you can, with all the time that you can, with all yes. that you can Amen. to make God's word known to people. You may not be able to go, but you can send. Hallelujah. You might not be able to take time as much as other people can, but you can send somebody. You can give to the Lord's work. I'm not asking anybody for money. That's not my goal. But it's to say we have to make every effort Amen. possible Amen. to let people know. Based on this passage, it should galvanize you. It should light a fire in your soul yes. to say, Lord, this is true. This is real. What about my loved ones? What about my family? Yes. What about my friends? What about even my enemies? Mm-hmm. Remember, God waits. He tarries. He's wishing, he's desiring that nobody should perish, but all come to repentance. And the gospel of the kingdom will preach in the whole world. Then the end will come. And the Lord said, Lo, I'll be with you, even till the end of the age. As we approach the end of the age, the Lord's going to be with us. Don't be discouraged. Hallelujah. Don't have feeble knees. Don't have weak arms. Right? Don't have droopy hands. Mm-hmm. Lift up your heads. Your redemption draws near. Let's Hallelujah. pray. Lord, we're so thankful you, that you put us alive at a time like this. That you made us alive in Christ Jesus. We who were dead, to sin, who were dead in sins yes. are now we call the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And now we are dead to sin. And so, Amen. Father, we praise you. Hallelujah. But, Lord, we learn from this passage that there are difficult things coming upon the earth. We've seen nothing yet. There's been trials and difficulties in our world. 
and many of our loved ones and, and many of our, uh, our friends, Lord, do not know you. And yet there's things coming upon the earth that they're not prepared for. Lord, help us to be ready for us to tell them. Lord, our brothers and sisters are suffering in the rest of, our, in the rest of this world. They know what this passage is about more than we. Yes. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us. Lord, we don't, um, we don't have to be wishing for suffering, Lord. But we do, Lord, know no. in our hearts that we are willing, Lord. We are willing for your sake to suffer, that that's your call to us, Lord. Yes. But we ask you, Lord, that you help us. By your spirit, strengthen our hearts and minds. We know, Lord God, that the end draws near. We know the end is coming. The end of the age is approaching. Lord, I don't know how much time we have. We may have more time. We might have less time. But, Lord, we have to make our calling and election sure. We have to know, Lord God, what we believe and be able to proclaim it to others. Please, Lord, help us. We're weak, but you are strong. Lord, we don't know much, but you have all wisdom. Would you give us that wisdom, Lord? and that boldness and that courage to let people know about your great love and your great mercy, but also, Lord, about your great judgment and your great wrath. For you will come, Lord, to reign in this world, and you will remove all sin, Lord, and that reality comes, Lord. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to declare your name and not be ashamed of your name. So, Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Give them, Lord, an increase in their faith empower them by your spirit and cause their love to grow much deeper for you and for others. For all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.